The sanctity of human life is under assault. Find out how and what you can do about it in this edition of Life Matters with Brian Johnston, Western Regional Director of the National Right to Life Committee. Welcome back to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brian Johnston, and this is your program on life culture and the very real battle of ideas. Yes, you're in a battle right now. You didn't expect it, but it's here. It's a battle for your culture, and it may even be a battle for your life and the life of your loved ones. We're going to have a great show today. We've got several uh, guests. In our second segment, we're going to talk to an old friend, Lawrence Lair, in Sonoma County, California, who's doing an amazing job there. We've got a call in from a listener. We'll answer some of his questions. But today's important because I'm going to outline for you what's happening in this battle. You know, no battle can be won unless there's an effective plan, unless there's a team, an army willing to go to battle. In World War II, there were very serious battles, and the winners were those who had the best army, best trained, and it was an extraordinary war if you studied history. And uh, I know in the Pacific, it was mostly the United States Marines, God bless them, that uh, cleaned up those islands and paid a heavy price, but they won. And if you think about it, those were just guys. Those were just American kids that volunteered and were trained. They had to understand the nature of the battle. They had to understand how to do battle and how to use the weapons of their warfare. You're involved in this battle now. Many of us are volunteers, but it's just as real. It is a very real battle of very evil ideas, and we must fight them. And you want to be spiritually prepared. I'm going to let you do that. But in a very real sense, I want to talk about some of the bayonets and the weapons that you have to use, and they're in the realm of ideas. And right now, there's very dangerous ideas that have become laws that you can actually kill human babies, that the government in California now is is one of the last places that pays for the abortion industry with your tax money. That's a bad idea. In California now, there's an idea that became law that says if someone's very sick, well, now medicine, instead of being used to either cure, and if it couldn't cure, it should be used to comfort them, well, now it's legal to kill them with medicine, to actually kill a vulnerable person. That's a very dangerous law, and yet it's a law. It's an idea. It's become law. You've got to be involved in this fight, and we want to ask you to do that. How do we do it? Well, there's a lot of pro-life people, and I'm very proud of them. I've met many across the nation. Let me give you one example. It's a group called NOEL. That is the National Organization for Episcopalians for Life. NOEL. They're great people. I love them. I work with them. But something may occur to you, and it's actually occurred to them too. And that is, as important as it is for them to be involved with their church, this is not an Episcopalian issue. And this is not a Baptist issue. This is not a Catholic issue. And sometimes it's reduced to that. And our opponents will be very quick to say, well, this is your religion. No, this is much bigger than Episcopalians or Baptists or Evangelicals or Catholics. This is a human issue. This is a human rights issue. Remember, this is an argument about what is a self-evident truth. Because the right to life is based on self-evident truths. That's what our founders put in those documents. We hold these truths to be self-evident. It is self-evident that a human baby is killed in an abortion. If there is no killing, if there is no death, then there's been no abortion. No, so these are very real battles. How do we get involved? I want to tell you about the National Right to Life Committee. The reason I got involved many years ago now, the reason I got involved is I saw it was an organization that cut through to the real issues, that cut like a knife through the emotions, through the religious predilections, to the actual point of the debate. It's a human life. This is a civil rights issue for those who cannot defend themselves. That's what the right to life is. So the National Right to Life Committee is a team that is non-sectarian. There are so many folks involved. I've learned so much about different peoples, different denominations, and they're wonderful people. But they know it's not about their denomination or about their personal theology. They're committed to changing the laws so that the laws will once again protect innocent human life. So the National Right to Life Committee is non-sectarian and it's non-partisan. You don't have to be a particular political party, although political parties are clearly arrayed in this battle. This is even bigger than a political party. We are dealing with the very specific issues of the right to life. And the National Right to Life Committee allows people to unify around that. And then it equips volunteers to be trained, just like those Marines. 
to be trained to focus on the actual battle at hand. And that battle is in your state. It's in your community, in your civic process. You vote every two years to elect representatives. Do you know how they stand? Because they make laws. If you aren't equipped for this battle, you can't win. It's almost like having volunteers that want to play football. I've ever, have you ever played uh, pickup football, you know, shirts and skins? And it's great to volunteer for things. But I have to tell you, you won't win any football games against pros. A pickup football team will not beat the Green Bay Packers. So we're involved in a very real battle of ideas. And it's a battle for our culture. And it's a battle that we want to win because lives really are at stake. So we're going to come back in a bit, and if you want to look up National Right to Life at nrlc.org, you can learn more about the National Right to Life Committee. In the state of California, the California affiliate is California Pro-Life Council at californiaprolife.org. When we come back, we're going to talk to a chapter chairman in California Pro-Life who's been at this for a while. He'll explain how the battle of ideas takes place in his community because it's, it's taking place in yours. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Well, you know that Life Matters is about life, culture, and the battle of ideas. In no place is the battle of ideas more evident than in Hollywood, California. I have on with me Bo Bryant. He's the communications director for the Life Fest Film Festival. Hey, Bo. Hey, Brian. How are you doing? Great. Hey, tell us about Life Fest, what it is and what happens. Okay, so Life Fest is the film festival dedicated to showcasing films that affirm the intrinsic worth of human life and the profound significance of each life. So Life Film Fest is based in the heart of the entertainment industry. It's in Hollywood, California, and it takes place every year. So this year, it takes place from May 4th to May 7th. 2017, so that's the first weekend in May. And really what it is, it's about bringing together experienced Hollywood professionals with those just mm-hmm. starting out in the industry so that we can really showcase films that affirm life, life culture, and really engage in the battle of ideas. Awesome. That is excellent. How, how can folks get in touch with Life Fest? We're always looking for volunteers. We're looking for people to sign up, or if you have a film that you'd like to submit and have it shown there, you can find all of our information at lifefilmfest.com. It says Life Film Fest. Com. It's Life Film Fest, and we hope to hear more from you, Bo, and Life Film Fest. Thanks a lot. Talk soon. Awesome. Thank you. Find out about the exciting cultural change impacting Hollywood. Go to lifefilmfest.com. And now, back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston and a very special guest. And I'm on right now with a good friend who's been in the pro-life movement a long time. Lawrence Lair is a local chairman of a local chapter in the California Pro-Life Council, and as such, it's a local chapter of the National Right to Life Committee. And Lawrence, we want to talk a little bit about what you do there in Sonoma County, California, and some of the ways that you reach out to the community. Well, Brian, thank you so much for uh, getting me involved here on this call. Uh, Yes, I've been involved with the pro-life movement for many, many years, decades. Uh, and we've had a local group here in Sonoma County for many years, been a affiliate of the National Right to Life and the California Pro-Life Council for all that time. And we are a very active group. We have uh, a number of regular members who attend our regular meetings, and we have a number of activities that we do year in and year out. So what would you like to hear about? Well, tell us uh, some of the things that a local chapter does. What are the resources? have and uh, items that you make available? How do you impact the local community? What we do, Brian, is we have regular events every year that we have input in. We do a fair booth every year here at our county fair. We put fetal models out in a lot of information, a lot of brochures that are specifically geared, in this case, to fetal development. That allows us to have a lot of conversations, particularly with young families and children and mothers, uh, pregnant women. So Mm -hmm. that's something that we look forward to every year. We also do rallies. Uh, We have a January 22nd rally we do every year in the public square here in our city that brings attention to the issue. We have speakers and music and prayer. We also have a speakers bureau that speaks in where we're invited, schools and churches.
churches. So we're involved in a number of things on an, on an ongoing basis, and we publish a newsletter usually four times a year to keep. We have a nice uh, mailing list. Yeah. So we're we're trying to put out as much information as we can. Obviously, there's a lot of developments that happen all the time. So keeping people aware of what's going on both at the national, state, and local level requires us to stay involved and stay in communication. Mm -hmm. The local folks that are involved, are they from just one church, or what's the uniqueness of Sonoma County Pro-Life? Well, we, we work with many churches in the community here. We have a number of pastors that we've identified as being pro-life and who aren't afraid to bring up the issue in their church. We furnish them information. I encourage them to speak on the issue as frequently as possible. And then we have a lot of members who are involved with the churches. So a lot of what we do is with the churches, but we also do quite a bit outside of the faith community. Mm -hmm. We live in a pretty liberal politically, but we found that there's a lot of liberals who understand that respecting life is an important part of the liberal t tradition, so we work with them, mm -hmm. and that's actually some of the, the most satisfying thing we do is reach across the, the aisle and you know build bridges to people. We also have conversations with elected officials, mm -hmm. uh, both locally, and then we'll go to Sacramento the state capitol here occasionally and meet with legislators there. You know, there's a lot there's a lot involved with having a local chapter, but it's very satisfying and I think that all of our volunteers really enjoy the work and are encouraged that they are making a difference by just showing up and, and getting involved and testifying to the importance of the right to life. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. No, and, and I think you're so right. It's really a unifying principle because it's a self-evident truth of the right to life, and it is the basis of our whole society. So, yeah, I remember when it was much more common for liberals to be pro-life. They were the pro-life side in one sense, but that'll change again. It'll come back around. One of the things I was going to ask you, Lawrence, is, and I know we've worked on stuff, so I know the answer, but folks need to know about society and about the laws. What, what do you guys do in elections? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. That's one of the things that we feel is very important for a local chapter to do and what we do. Every, every election, we publish a voter's guide in conjunction with the state office. And mm -hmm. we will distribute that around churches because it's nonpartisan. They're able to hand it out. We also have done a lot of leafleting over the years, primarily in church parking lots. We find that's a really good place to get our message out because there's a natural affinity there among many of the churchgoers for the sanctity of life. So we will identify and support candidates and, and occasionally uh, initiatives that are on the ballot who share our convictions about the right to life. Yes, that is great. That's excellent. So it's really, it's really being involved in the community and being involved in the civic process. Absolutely. Lawrence, thanks so much. You're just a great guy, and it's a pleasure to be a friend and a co-laborer, and I know we'll talk soon. Great, Ryan. Thank you so much. I appreciate you talking to me. California Pro-Life is dedicated to winning California back for life. For more information, go to CaliforniaProLife.org. To follow Life Matters on all social media, go to lifematters.life, where you will find everything you need to know to share life, culture, and the battle of ideas with everyone you care about. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Well, you know, on Life Matters, we do talk a lot about you and how important and extraordinary you are as an individual. And the reason I can say that is I'm not just blowing sunshine at you. I'm actually repeating what America's founders said in the very important documents that created this nation. They asserted that you as a human being, as an individual, have certain qualities that are endowed by your creator that the government, big, generous, massive government, couldn't possibly give you those qualities. And that government isn't capable of giving you those qualities. Government's job is to protect your life, is to protect that unique creation that you are. And our founder said that. 
endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. And so now we see that that right to life has actually been removed from our laws. In 1973, that right to life as a legal premise for our society was suspended. And that's why we have so many abortions. And that's why now we're looking at euthanasia. You know, in many states, in California, all along the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, and then several of the other states, they've legalized voluntary euthanasia. You know, that's what assisted suicide really is. It's voluntary euthanasia. But if you have been in the medical profession and you've seen how these things are practiced, the voluntary nature of that is very, very shadowy. So we are seeing medicine used to kill. We have seen a suspension of the legal right to life. The only way to change that is we have to function as citizens. We must take our responsibility as citizens seriously. And that's what the right to life movement does. We're people of diverse backgrounds. Lawrence is an insurance salesman and has been for years, but he commits himself to changing his community and the values of his community. And that's what people do in every Right to Life chapter across the nation. If you'd like to be involved in helping restore your community and your state's laws and the national laws, it's very important to work towards that end with diverse people that are also citizens and they're part of the community. And that's what we'd like to do is give you that opportunity. Now, regardless of your skills and abilities, there's a place for you, too. If you are just an organizer or you're just, uh, let's say you have strong convictions about this, but you need to be better trained, we can offer you that training. We get calls all the time. School teachers will have Planned Parenthood asked to come and speak to the kids and often they'll let them. Here's the challenge they have. I get calls from them and our office and our various regional groups get calls for a pro-life spokesperson. We want to send that person to those public schools. Sometimes, though, we don't have people who are trained to present the self-evident truth of what the right to life is, to explain how it's not because of my personal worldview that you have to change the laws, but that explains that child's beating heart, that explains why the laws were there before Roe v. Wade. We're going to see if the next justice is Justice Gorsuch, and then there's subsequent justices, there's a very good chance we're going to see Roe v. Wade overturned. But what are you going to do then? Because then it's going to come back to the states. It's going to come back to your community. And I'm very surprised at how woefully unprepared many churches even, how unprepared they are to address the issue, to equip the saints, to explain to them the warp and woof, the height and depth and breadth of why these laws are important. And they're vitally important. So if you're involved in a local chapter, You can help make that difference. There's also community events where we need folks involved. And then obviously every two years, we do encourage people and we're set up both on the national level all the way down to the local level in how to appropriately get folks involved in the election process. So a local chapter is involved in changing the community. And then those communities are involved in changing that state. And then ultimately, we can change our nation. So we want to welcome you to the Right to Life movement. Go to nrlc.org to find out more about the National Right to Life Committee. If you are listening in California, go to californiaprolife.org. That's californiaprolife.org. For more information, call 800-924-2490. California Pro-Life is dedicated to winning California back for life. For more information, go to californiaprolife.org. You're listening to Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Well, you know that Life Matters is about life, culture, and the battle of ideas. In no place is the battle of ideas more evident than in Hollywood, California. I have on with me Bo Bryant. He's the communications director for the Life Fest Film Festival. Hey, Bo. Hey, Brian. How are you doing? Great. Hey, tell us about Life Fest, what it is and what happens. Okay, so Life Fest is the film festival dedicated to showcasing films that affirm the intrinsic worth of human life and the profound significance of each life. So Life Film Fest is based in the heart of the entertainment industry. It's in Hollywood, California. 
California, and it takes place every year. So this year, it takes place from May 4th to May 7th, 2017. So that's the first weekend in May. And really what it is, it's about bringing together experienced Hollywood professionals with those just mm-hmm. starting out in the industry so that we can really showcase films that affirm life, life culture, and really engage in the battle of ideas. Awesome. That is excellent. How, how can folks get in touch with LifeFest? We're always looking for volunteers. We're looking for people to sign up, or if you have a film that you'd like to submit and have it shown there, you can find all of our information at LifeFilmFest.com. So that's LifeFilmFest.com. That's LifeFilmFest, and we hope to hear more from you, Bo, and LifeFilmFest. Thanks a lot. Talk soon. Awesome. Thank you. Find out about the exciting cultural change impacting Hollywood. Go to LifeFilmFest.com. If you have questions or comments for Life Matters, call 800-924-2490. Give us your name and the town you're calling from and a quick question or comment. Here's a question we received from a listener. This is Jesse from Coahuila. If someone is genuinely suffering and wants to die, why can't we help them? Well, Jesse, thanks for that question. You know, I'm glad you asked it, even the way you asked it, because you really sum up how a lot of people feel about this issue. And that's the reality of this issue. It is mostly based in feelings. You know, a shameless plug here, if you haven't had a chance, I do have a book on this, Death as a Salesman, What's Wrong with Assisted Suicide, available on Amazon and wherever fine books are sold. Uh, And then there's also a documentary. It's also called Death as a Salesman. What's wrong with assisted suicide? And I address a lot of these issues. Let me quickly address them now. Again, one of the things you're talking about is suffering and pain. Again, I've been at many deathbeds. I've been at the deathbeds of family members and of total strangers. And it's never emotionally easy. It's often the best of times. It's bittersweet because um, it's, it's just the nature of what's happening. And if you understand what it is, it's, it's an awesome experience to be with someone as they die and to be there to comfort and care for them, it's, a, it's an honor. But I want to say, if someone is suffering and they're in pain, what you need to do is, it's three words. If the doctor's not dealing with that pain, get another doctor. The resources for pain management are so advanced. Again, the, the prohibition against assisted suicide goes back 3,000 years, and they had a worse time than we're having now, I promise you, that the resources of of uh, pharmacology are so great, and many of them are not opioids. There's some great pain management tools that are very, very benevolent and less invasive and non-addictive. There's a whole cornucopia of great pain management tools. So again, if you or a loved one are in pain and your doctor isn't dealing with that pain, simple answer, get another doctor. It's really important. But the emotions are what are more powerful, I have found, that Pain, physical pain, there's medicines, there's interventions that can be dealt with there. If you don't have intervention for the emotions, that's when things get dangerous. I believe strongly in in good counseling. Dame Cicely Saunders is the founder of Modern Hospice. She set up the St. Christopher's Hospice in London, England in the 1960s. And what she said is that in a terminal situation, you must view the patient and the family members and friends as the target of intervention. And what she was saying was this, you know, the patient may be going through something they've never been through before. It's hard emotionally if you're diagnosed with a terminal condition, but the people around them have never been through that either, more than likely. And the emotions, what if it's a a, a breadwinner of the family going through that? It's not just that suffering of that loved one, but the implications for the family. Whoever it is, your family members often need more intervention and counseling. There's an interesting book on death and dying. And in that, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talks about the powerful emotions. And you already know some of these. It's called the five stages of grieving. A denial, anger, bargaining, and then finally getting around to acceptance. But the anger and the denial... And all of those emotional turmoil, if you make a decision when you're going through that, you're going to make bad decisions. Finally, there's something else that that you had said I thought was really insightful, Jesse, because it's what our opponents use all the time. Help them. Why don't we help them? And that is what good hospice does. It helps those that are going through this very difficult time and helps the family members to address and face this reality and to comfort them in the ways that we need to comfort them to prepare for life for them that goes on, 
And for those who are coming to the end of their life, too, and really see it and, and adjust to it, because it's going to happen to all of us. Helping people as they die is a wonderful honor, as I started out saying. It's what Mother Teresa did in Calcutta. She went to the gutters and helped the poorest of the poor. She never killed them. And what happened is that the language has been twisted when the Hemlock Society, or Compassion and Choices, as they call themselves now, when they talk about helping someone as they die. They're talking about killing them. You see, they're talking about intervening. They're not talking about dying a natural death. They're talking about taking a lethal tool, a poison of some kind, and using it against that patient to kill them, to stop their heart, their breathing, just to end their life. And that is very unnatural. That's not letting nature take its course. That's using medicine, which is designed to benefit people, It's using it as a lethal tool to kill people. And once medicine is used that way, it's extremely dangerous as a profession. We'll talk about that another time. But true help is caring and comforting. Again, what Mother Teresa and Good Hospice does. Helping someone is qualitatively different than causing them to die. Helping someone as they're dying is very different than being the cause of their dying. And that's why we have to oppose assisted suicide, or any form of euthanasia. So great question, Jesse. And again, because you really hit the nail on the head, our culture seems to gloss over the important action of this is causing someone to be dead and has been against the law for literally centuries upon centuries. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Again, if anybody else has a question, feel free to call us at 800-924-2490. Glad to hear from you. Thanks a lot. Learn more about everything in today's show online at lifematters.life, where you'll find all the resources you need to protect life. Subscribe to the Life Matters podcast, where we have even more information on this and all the life issues. Go to lifematters.life to subscribe. Listen to more Life Matters every Saturday at 1 p.m. right here on KCBC. KCBC.